Good morning. All right, Chris talked me into the music stand pulpit. He shamed me into it. I said, you know the history of pulpits, when they get nice and big, is because the speaker has something to hide behind when things start flying. I don't get a lot of protection here. So, bear with me. Yes, famous last word. Thank you, Chuck. You have to love me. You have to love me. Amen. Okay. Um, emphasizing uh, the thing about the farewell thank you dinner for Billy and Delora too, please. Um, we're trying to limit the number to about 300. That's what we're planning a meal for. So uh, please remember, get the tickets out, out in the uh, foyer after service. All right, turn your Bibles. We'll start um, Jeremiah 1. Now, if you looked at the um, note-taking guide, I, didn't, I hope you didn't gasp and think, good grief, Mark, how long are you going to go? <laughs> the title of the message is Perfect People Not Allowed. We talked about the fun and dysfunction thing, and I always use it as a phrase here. But, and I know Rick sort of stole my thunder a few weeks ago when he was preaching, and he used that phrase because he said we wanted to hang it up out above the foyer. And I thought, doggone it, dude. You just, you know. But God bless him because I stole it from somebody else, so he took it from me, and that's the way it goes. I actually got it from a video series that we were watching at uh, the Barnabas Group at Tamburino's house, Jim Tamburino. And, um, and Linda, I'm sorry, Linda their house too, her house too. And the video series is called God for the Rest of Us. And really, really, really decent series. Um, very fruitful and meaningful discussions we had. But I, that particular phrase caught me. And as we prepared, as I prepared the message, we were talking about the sermon series. Um, it occurred to me that why not highlight a few of the characters in the Bible because none of them except for Jesus Christ is perfect anyway. And what I want to tie into are a couple of different things, which is why I'm probably going to give you a break. We'll come back after lunch. Um, I really am, I want you to appreciate, I really am working to ratchet this stuff down to about 35, 40 minutes to an hour, hour and a half. Um, only because when, I, when I get in front of people, I'm teaching, and I'm usually teaching for at least a day, if not two or three days in a row. So um, I have to get that in my head. All right, so you're, you're the, uh, Jeremiah, first chapter. So what I want to do is, as you look at the, the, uh, the note-taking guide, you'll see the list of names. And all I'm going to do, except for the first one, we are going to read Jeremiah. I'm not going to read through each of those scriptural references, because we really would be here through lunch. But for those who, and I know some of you are quite familiar with these characters, you probably have taught on them and read them out infinitum, but there may be some out there that maybe aren't really terribly tied into maybe the bigger picture involving these folks. So, perfect people not allowed starts with the Bible. He didn't use, God didn't use anybody who was perfect. And we should take heart in that. We should celebrate that. Which means we can all be used. And when we talk about presenting the vision, and by the way, the, the, the vision meeting, presentation next, next Sunday. Rick said you're going to get handouts. We want your feedback. We're just not going to belabor the meeting by allowing for Q&A um, because sometimes that can get a little carried away. But what we do want, we want you to take it back, read it, take, sit with your families, read it, sit with your, your family life groups, read it, come back to us with questions, thoughts, reactions, ideas. So it's not a question of not wanting your feedback. We're just going to limit the presentation so that you have the information and then, you know, email us, as some of you are not shy about doing, um, and we love your emails. Um, call us, schedule time with us, please. We want feedback because this is a vision to carry forth the family church, folks. Okay? And we need everybody. As we're going to highlight today, God used all kinds of people for His purpose. God can use anybody in this church to further His kingdom. Anyone. And I want you to take that to heart. So, as your finger is holding your place in the Bible, let me start 
with my personal experience. And um, some of you have, who I've talked with in the past know that I, I grew up Catholic as a young boy. And um, I'm not, this is not a finger pointing exercise of that particular denomination. Believe me, I have many, many dear family members and loved ones that I have in my life still. So that's not, I'm just going to share with you my experience. And my experience was this. I heard about most of these people that I'm going to talk about today. But I only heard about them in light of they were just ever so excellent. And there wasn't anybody that we could, I can conceivably aspire to be like. Because they, I mean, there were statues around all the place of some of them. We prayed to them all the time. But they were never presented. I never really got to hear some of what I'm going to talk about this morning. That human side of these folks. And you know what? That's critical. Because when somebody is presented to you and there's somebody you can relate to, you can say, you know what, that guy gets me, that lady gets me. She understands, She's been where I've, he's been where I've, I've been. This is why support groups work so well. Support groups are designed to be people who have had similar types of experiences, so that you don't feel alone. So it's great that our, our God and Savior used real people. We just need to be able to remember to read about them periodically if we haven't done so. And understand that these are the people he used and these are the people we are to, we can identify with to some extent. So we'll start with Jeremiah. Chapters 4, I mean chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, because I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah was a youth. Or as they say, my cousin Vinny, a youth. He was a youth. So what? Did God not know who he was talking to? Did God not know he was talking to this young man? This young boy? Did God not know that he was going to tell him, I don't know what to say. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. What does that look like in real life? We get caught up with some of these biblical sayings, which are wonderful to be able to call, on, call upon. But what does it look like in real life? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. What does that look like? It looks like some of the people we're going to talk about today. Lean not on your own understanding. A lot of times, that's what we're leaning on is our own understanding. That's what we make decisions on is our own understanding. In research, they talk about operationalizing a definition. When they do a research study, they want to use a term that they want to, they want to measure. Something like resiliency. Well, they can't just say, I'm going to measure resiliency. They have to define what resiliency looks like. Otherwise, they don't know how, you can't define a way to measure it. So when we read God's Word, when we, when we recall statements like, quotes like, lean, trust in the Lord with all your heart, we should think and pray on that. What does that look like in real life? It looks like some of the people here. So there's Jeremiah, who was a youth. And yet God used him. There they are. Most of them congregate on this side of the auditorium. All of our youths. 
God can use every one of them. Sometimes in a small way, sometimes in a much bigger way. I'm reminded of the story years ago when I met, I met with a federal officer after 9-11, and as many of us were at the time, she was fixed on the TV in the aftermath, in the days following. She had a little seven-year-old daughter who craved mommy's attention. But mommy couldn't tear herself away from the TV to the point where it's becoming a problem. So one day, her daughter walked up to the TV, turned it off, looked at mommy and said, time to go out and play. Great wisdom. Great wisdom. So our youth have something to bring to the table and God can use them. So let's go down the list a little bit. Again, like I said, I'm not going to berate these wonderful folks. It's just a question of looking at some of them and saying, yeah, you know what? They had a couple of problems. They had a couple of challenges. Personality, quirks, flaws, fears, anxieties, doubts. First one is Abraham, who on not one but two occasions presented Sarah, his beautiful wife, as his sister. When you read the first account, he did it because he was afraid the Egyptians were going to take heed of how beautiful Sarah was, take her and kill him. So he said, tell him you're my sister. Not exactly how you want to think most husbands would, would uh, behave, but there you are. He did it not on, one, not on one but two occasions. The quotes are there, the scripture references are there if you want to read about them. And yet this is the man who would become God, who would become the, the leader of God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. So, in spite of our humanness, okay? So there was Abraham. Now his wife Sarah. Sarah gets a promise from God that she'd bear a son in her advanced years. And what was her reaction? She laughed. And she was called out on it. Abraham said, why'd you laugh? Because God asked Abraham, why'd she laugh? Abraham said, Sarah, why'd you laugh? She goes, I didn't laugh. Come on! God makes you a promise, you laugh at the promise, and you don't think He knows? She's, you know, maybe scoffed a little bit at this idea. Let me know the next time God comes to you and gives you a promise. Tell me what the reaction you get when you laugh, if that happens to you. So Sarah kind of, you know, she wasn't exactly with the program early on. Now granted, you're looking and saying, well, she's in advanced years. Come on, Mark. Medically, you know, they get concerned about women who are having babies. The last I heard was, if you're beyond the age of 40, they raise an eyebrow. What is it now? 35. There you go. That's Emma, Emma Jean's mother, by the way. So, so 35, now they're, they're, they're more concerned. Sarah was way past 35. So we're allowed to have our dysfunction. Then we move on from Abraham and Sarah to Rahab. Now Rahab, um, in Joshua chapter 2, we know the story, for some of you who have read it, despite her heritage, she, Nationality, she was faithful in hiding and protecting the men of Israel from the wicked leaders of Jericho who were seeking them out. Rahab was a prostitute. And yet she was used by God. How would we react if a woman of the streets walked into the auditorium this moment? I mentioned the video God for the rest of us. One of the things I loved about the video is it highlights this pastor who was starting a church, who started a church years ago in Las Vegas. Okay, if you've been to Las Vegas, church and Las Vegas don't really go hand in hand. But his membership, his congregation, were made up of people who had jobs in Vegas and had questionable lives prior to giving their lives over to God. It's really fascinating to listen to them. One young man they had on video talked about being four years old, being taken to a hotel room by his mother, 
and sat in the corner of the room while she had sex with two other men. Now, tag that on for developmental problems down the road. And yet God brought, brought him along. He came to the Lord. He gave his life to God. He even, they showed an episode in the, in the video where he was attempting to reconcile with his mother. Very moving. Very moving. God can use any of us. So from Rahab, now Moses. I'll spend some time about Moses. Only because when I grew up, Moses was Charlton Heston. I don't know if he was, you know, I mean, I don't know what he, he was Chuck, he was Charlton Heston. Now, for my friends over here, Charlton Heston was a very famous actor in his day. And um, he was sort of like the Olympian ideal of, the, of, the, of his day. But Moses, he's another one who said, you want me to do what? I can't, uh, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. Not to mention that Moses had a little bit of an anger management problem. Okay? Anybody here struggle with their anger periodically? Anybody got a dead Egyptian buried in the desert anywhere? Moses did. Moses did, yet he was called to lead the, the Israelites out of slavery. Wow! He killed a guy and buried him. He had trouble controlling his anger. And yet, God used him. Moving right along. David. Well, in today's terminology, David was a peep in time. Read the story. He kind of sat and gazed in on Bathsheba. If we'd have caught him in law enforcement in today's day, we'd be locking him up. So, you know the story of Bathsheba. You know the story of what he did with Bathsheba's husband. And yet, David wrote, as we know, many of the Psalms and was called a man after God's own heart. So, does anybody have this type of thing in your background? I don't know what you did before you came to church this morning. So, think about it. So, let me see. We're going through them pretty good. Jeremiah, Abraham, Sarah, Rahab, Moses, David, and now Peter. Well, in the New Testament. And that was just the Old Testament. Peter was rebuked by Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. Not exactly something I'd want the Son of Man to say to me. But I think Peter got a little... there. Maybe I'll use the word arrogant, high and mighty, kind of figured out. Maybe he had it figured out. He knew his heart. He knew his mind. And when Jesus was telling him what was going to happen when he went to Jerusalem, surely not. What are you saying? And Jesus turns to him and says, get behind me, Satan. This has to happen. So Peter hasn't yet learned his lesson because he goes on on the eve of the trial after Jesus told him, before this night is over, you're going to deny me three times. you got a friend out there who's denied knowing you for fear of being embarrassed? Fear of being Taken to task. I didn't see him take that. No, I don't even know the guy. And yet we know Peter denied him. And the minute it happened, he was instantly convicted. Now these are all people of faith. People who ultimately allowed the Lord, allowed God to have their way with them. Have His way with them. Opening up their lives, their minds, and their hearts. Giving up their right to themselves. But they weren't without 
their faults. The last one I'm going to mention is Paul. Now, Toby gave a nice communion meditation a week ago on Paul. Paul basically terrorized Christians when he was still Saul. He was notorious. He was the guy you stayed away from. If you saw him coming, you ran the other way. It's like when Jim Cantore from the Weather Channel shows up on your street, not a good day. Okay? When Paul showed up, or Saul showed up on your street, get out of Dodge. He was persecuting. He was, putting, he was looking to put Christians in jail. Now, you want to talk about arrogance. He absolutely positively thought he was right. You know, the interesting thing about Paul, we know the story of the road to Damascus. We know he was struck and was blind. But I think if we think about the life of Paul for a minute, when he was still Saul, I think we get the fact that Paul was blind long before he was struck blind. I think God struck him blind sort of just drive the point home. You know, they say sometimes, you know, the phrase, when God wants to use someone greatly, He has to first hurt them deeply. I think he, Paul sort of epitomizes that statement. Paul stood by while Stephen was stoned. You guys stood by while somebody else was persecuted or being ridiculed for their faith and didn't say a word, encouraged it, matter of fact, supported those who were doing it. And yet, he wrote most of what we read in the New Testament. Fascinating. So just looking at this initial group of people that God called upon. Varied backgrounds, genders, ages. And one of the things I want to really emphasize coming, at, coming uh, full uh, to, the, to the present is when we present this vision next week, guys. As Rick said, this is a vision that we've, we've been working on pretty feverishly for the last several months. We think it's a good one. It's not perfect. But in order to make this happen, in order to carry it forward, it's not just up to the leadership in this church. It is up to every single person here. And those who we're unable to make it today. That's why we want your feedback. We want your ideas. We want you joined as a family. If we're going to talk about being a family, we've got to put our feet to the grind, our nose to the grindstone, our boots on the ground, whatever analogy you want to use. And we've got to learn to look past not only our own humanness, and understand that God can use us, but to look past that in each other. Because you know what? We're going to mess up. We're going to disappoint you. Not just leaders, but we all do. We all disappoint one another on a regular basis. We don't mean to, but that's what happens. Why? Because we're not perfect. And I pray that anyone coming through these doors is not looking for that. Is not looking for the ideal church setting. There is none. You know the joke about the perfect church is the one that has no members. So when we come together to carry forth this vision, we need all the imperfect people we can get. We want to hear from each one of you. We want to walk together with you in this. So let's look at some of the takeaways. And this will be some of the bullet points that are on your handout. And some of these come from a guy named Ron Forseth, so I, I appropriated these from some of the writings he had. So the first one, the first blank, is God is unashamedly honest in his portrayal of the human condition. God wants us to understand these were real, flawed people 
that he called upon. I don't know how else to drive that point home. It may be sound like I'm repeating myself. It's like, yeah, Mark, we get it. I hope so. Because I encounter people all the time who question their ability to serve. Well, I'm not capable of teaching. I've not really studied the Bible. I'm not, I'm not a preacher. I'm not an elder. I'm not a leader. I've had problems in the past. And we let that stop us. We let that stop us. I think it's one of the reasons why we see the same 20% or so who seem to constantly be stepping up to serve at the church. And that's not me talking. That's the reality of the situation. I'm not pointing a finger, but I'm, my, my, my point here is I'm praying that we're not serving because I pray, that we're not, not serving because we're keeping ourselves from doing it. We're hesitant to step up because we don't think we're smart enough. We don't think we're funny enough. We don't think we're personable enough. We second guess everything we do. Or maybe we've made some poor decisions in the past. Or maybe we're in a troubled marriage right now. Or maybe one of our kids has gone astray. Or maybe we've been self-medicating to get through a difficult time. My point is, so what? We have a God who is greater than that. And again, if we don't get it, read these stories. These people did nothing of their own accord for the kingdom. It was because of God's, effect, God's impact. Them saying, use me. And all we're saying is it's a, it can be the exact same situation for anyone here if you are open to being used by Jesus Christ, by the Lord. God can use you to further His kingdom. So, His portrayal of the human condition, He wants us to know that people He used were used in spite of their humanness. He wants us to be authentic Christians, not to succumb to the temptation to misrepresent ourselves or to put on a mask for the benefit of others. Are we coming in misrepresenting because it's safer? There's another little interesting behavior. Are we playing it safe? Are we doing just enough? You know, we talk about the gifts that God, that we have, the spiritual gifts we have. But sometimes I think we are called to, to serve in a capacity that doesn't necessarily match up to the gifts we have. Well, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't be any good at that. Maybe, maybe not, but maybe that's where the need is. Maybe that's where, boom, we step out on faith. Say, all right, God, I have no idea what I'm doing. Direct me. Open up to Him. Let Him lead you through an unfamiliar path. Let Him take you on the journey. The second fill-in. Our dysfunction cannot be equated with our standing before God. This simply sort of reinforces don't let your issues define you as it pertains to your relationship to God. Don't let your issues, your challenges, your insecurities, your deceitful hearts, your jealousies, your anger, your arrogance, whatever. Don't let it get in the way. Don't let it define you. To the point where it negatively impacts your relationship to God and your ability to step up and serve. There are people here who can help you with that, and not just people in leadership, not just people on staff. There are people here who should be open to being there for you. That's what family's about. So that was number two on the fill-in-the-blanks. Number three, 
even if our, and this comes directly from Scripture, even if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. Even if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. I'm a big believer in the effect of self-talk. Whether we realize it or not, we wake up each morning giving ourselves messages. Talking about what this day is going to be like. Talking about how we are going to be. We give ourselves constant messages. And sometimes those messages tear us down. Sometimes those messages defeat us before we even put our, our foot out of the bed on the floor. Why bother? We talk about that in terms of just the days of the week. Sunday nights lead into Monday morning, so we hate Sunday nights. Wednesday's hump day. Okay, we're getting there. And then TGIF. There is even a restaurant named. It all plays into the mentality. How do we view our situation? And if you don't think the way you think affects your relationship to God, you need to rethink that. If you don't believe that your day-to-day thoughts, your day-to-day self-talk affects your relationship to God, I believe you need to revisit that whole concept. Because I think it's the things you tell yourself on a day-to-day basis. If you carry the mantle of Christian, as Jeff said this morning, being holy is not a suggestion. But what does that look like day to day? So, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And again, Paul spent much of his energy struggling with sin, and yet he tells us in 1 Corinthians, he left the task of judging himself with God. Pretty good advice. So, we see that God can use anyone for his purpose. You don't have to be perfect. Matter of fact, you can't be. Anybody guilty of being a perfectionist? Oh, that's, don't raise your hand. Think about it. Do you live with a perfectionist? Are you raising a perfectionist? It is a recipe for disaster. Can't be. Striving for something that's not possible. So what about God's plan for our life? As I've sort of beaten to death a little bit this morning, you don't have to be a preacher, teacher, counselor, deacon, evangelist, elder, or in any other shape, form, look at somebody as if they're being mightily, to be mightily used by God, you can just open yourselves up. It's not just showing up. Woody Allen was wrong. Woody Allen was a comedian and an actor and a director and stuff. I just, we have to bring, we have to bring them along. He said, what, 50, half of life is just showing up. Eh. Okay. For some of you, yes. Okay. But to be used, you have to be willing to give up your right to yourself. I've used that phrase a couple of times. Give up your right to yourself. Submit. We use these terms all the time. And yet inevitably, I keep coming back to the same question for every one of us, myself included, what does that look like? Put it in real terms. Put it in real behaviors. Giving up our right to ourselves. Allowing the Holy Spirit to convict us when somebody does something and we're ready to fly off the handle. It's okay to sit there and go, God says I've got to love Him. (laughs) When I just want to... Why God gave us feet or a car or some sort of transportation that we can 
Walk away from him for a few minutes. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit who we received through the waters of baptism to have his way in our lives, to have his way in our thoughts, to have his way in our hearts, to have his way in our marriages, to have his way in our relationships with friends, to have his way in our attitude in the church with one another. Don't automatically jump to conclusions that somebody has malicious intent. Everybody's got a story, folks. People behave for a whole variety of different reasons. Even the office malcontent, if you work in an office setting. Even the guy or gal who, when they don't show up, it's a good day for everybody else. Now tell me you're not thinking about somebody right now. You are. You are talking, thinking about somebody right now. Even they have a story. This stuff doesn't just happen. And what we have to do first and foremost is extend that, that level of courtesy and consideration, love and kindness to one another. Believe me when I tell you your leadership is probably one of the most wonderful groups of godly men I've ever been around. And let me tell you something, guys. We don't always agree. And we've had some interesting discussions. We really have. And we will continue to have some interesting discussions. But I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, this group of imperfect men have the best interests of God's church. And we are striving day in and day out which is why we want you to be a part of this vision with us. My last point to fill in the blank. God does not call the qualified. God does not call up the qualified. Rather, He qualifies those whom He calls. He does not call up the qualified. Rather, He qualifies those whom He calls. Somebody suggested make a t-shirt out of that. Maybe we will. Last point I want to make this morning came to me this morning as I was reviewing the notes. And it's something I struggle with. And I've been praying in earnest for a while now. I think one of the enemy's greatest weapons against us is discouragement. I think when all else fails, he, he knows where our weak points are. So if you're walking around thinking ill of yourself, of your abilities to serve, He's going to try every angle he can to discourage you. And it's a very powerful tool in his arsenal. It gives rise to a whole lot of other potentially negative and damaging emotions and thoughts. Once we become discouraged, all kinds of things can flow from that. Well, you know what? The heck with this place. I've had it. Or the heck with those people. Or the heck with this job. Or the heck with this marriage. I've given it my all. I've got nothing else to give. That may come out as anger, as frustration, but it's also discouragement. And once you let that take root, be careful because He's got you. We will become discouraged at times. It's why He gave us one another. It's one of the challenges we have in keeping our marriages together, keeping our families together, keeping our churches together, keeping true to God's Word. Because it's real easy to get discouraged and to allow that to take root. So please be mindful of that. And um, we're going to go to our invitation.
if you're thinking about, if you're new to Severn, if you're visiting with us, this is an opportunity. If you're thinking about turning your life over to the Lord, if you've been struggling with the things we've been talking about this morning, and yet you know something's got to change, folks, there's nothing else that works like the Savior. Take heart in knowing we don't have to be perfect because we have a perfect Savior. So please, if you feel that this is something that uh, you need in your life, come on down, we'll talk, steer you in the direction to get additional assistance. So, let's pray for those folks that are in that place. And my brothers and sisters, my friends up here, take us into song.